This is Ronald Coleman, inviting you to radio's most dramatic half-hour, Favorite Story. All mankind loves a good story. I guess the business of storytelling began when the first ancient hunter told his fellow cave dwellers of his hunting and fishing exploits. No doubt exaggerating a little, as some of us are inclined to do. And this very day, in the cities of the Near East, you may see the storytellers in the bazaars and in the marketplaces spinning wondrous tales inherited from centuries past. Still the audiences gather and are held spellbound. The age-old tales of a fascination for all of us. Yet it's the new story we search for, the fresh angle, the unexpected. And, of course, that's particularly true here in Hollywood. That's why favorite story welcomes the choice of producer-director Michael Curtis, who brought to the screen such favorites as Life with Father, Mildred Pierce, and Casablanca, for which he won the coveted Academy Award. And his choice, written by Arthur Wister Mays, has the happy quality of surprise. It revolves around... A single copper penny. One of radio's best-known young actors, Jack Webb, will tell us the story. We're ready then for Act One of The Copper Penny. Look, get this straight right away. I'm not the kind of a guy you'd invite over for dinner to meet your eligible daughter. I'm a broken-down newspaper man who couldn't hold a job in any city bigger than a cow pasture. So... I'm back where I began. Wilmot, Ohio. <laughs> Believe me, brother. You need better than 2020 vision to find this burg on a map. Wilmot, Ohio. Uh, just a minute. Hold it. Hold it, will you? Let's cut out the hearts and flowers, huh? If that's supposed to be a musical description of this town, you've got the wrong place, mister. Tell me, where do people get the idea that just because a town is small... That means that nothing goes on but prayer meetings and nature being lovely. We've got almost as much corruption as a big city. Well, you got the idea. I'm the cold potato you couldn't squeeze a tear out of. I knock out copy for a punk little newspaper in my hometown and nothing affects me. Nothing. Excuse me a minute, will you? Yeah. Yeah, this is the newspaper. This is Jack Hudson. If you got any news fancier than a lawn social, I got a pencil and an open mind, so what's your story? Oh, oh. No kidding. Oh, that's awful. That's terrible. I guess that's the worst news you could give me in this town. What? Huh? Sure, sure, we'll write it up. I don't know how exactly, but I'll get out the story. A story. And I gotta write it. So you put a sheet of paper in a typewriter and... What do you say? You can't say it. Shakespeare and Ernest Hemingway rolled together couldn't say it. How's a man gonna write something about this and put it next to the ad for the meat mark? All you can do is remember. About Ben and a penny in the courtroom. And suddenly your memory begins to do nip-ups. And you, you remember when you were a kid and you walked over to the library and met Ben for the first time. Hello, son. Is this what they call the library? That's what they call it. What do you sell here? Sell? Why, we don't sell anything. Yeah? Then what's the deal? Why don't you walk around and just see what strikes your fancy? I'm not sure I want to. Door opens both ways. You can come in or out anytime you want. The guys that hang around the railroad yard say anybody comes in here is a sissy. They wouldn't want any of them to see me in here. That's so. Well, maybe they've got a point. I guess a library's not a place for a man who uses a fist all the time. Railroad yard's a good place to exercise your muscles. In here, lad, we exercise our souls. You're sort of crazy. Yeah. I've heard that said before, too. Now, come here a second, boy. Let me introduce you to a few other maniacs. On this shelf, we have a young fellow who was plumb up as mine. Name of Shakespeare. One of these fine days, you ought to meet him face to face. Uh, 
Right now, I think you ought to meet another crazy fool. You're, uh, about 12, I'd say. Right? 12 and a half. Going on 13. Mm -hmm. Young fella, shake hands with Mark Twain. Whole bookshelf here, designed for 12 and a half year olds. Uh, going on 13. <laughs> One man in this whole town with anything in his heart but a dollar sign. Ben Carter, the town librarian. He belonged in the library, I guess. Just as much as the World Almanac did, or Robinson Crusoe. Ben had a way of leading you to something when you were right for it. You looked at Ben and you remembered how he kind of steered you. So you didn't know you were steered at all. To the Knights of the Round Table. To Ivanhoe and... David Copperfield. And suddenly, life stopped being narrow and small towns. Suddenly, your mind expanded beyond the railroad yards. And you were Huck Finn, going down the Mississippi River. You were going out to fight in shining armor for the lovely Rebecca. You were the king of the Golden River. And Marco Polo at the court of Kubla Khan. That's why I always wanted to be a writer, but I never was. Just a newspaper hack who couldn't hold on to a job in Cleveland or Columbus or St. Louis or Detroit or any place. And so I came back where I started from, back to Wilmot, with my tail between my legs. And I went to see the only person in town I gave two hoots about, Ben. Jack, how are you, boy? I'm very glad to see you again. Why, Ben? Why are you glad to see me? Because you're one of my boys. Tell me, have you written a book yet? A great war novel? Huh? No, Ben, no. I haven't written anything. Just traffic accident reports and obituaries, and I didn't like them good enough to hang on to a job. I've been canned all over the map. I'm a big nothing. Oh, well, not with what you've got inside your head. Jack, you need me help. Can I do anything? Oh, thanks, Ben. Thanks a lot. I got my old job back on the local paper. Oh, that's fine. It'll be good having you back in town. Even though I'm a big flop? Oh, no flop. You don't have to go running a thousand miles away to amount to anything. Why, look at me. I'm a long way from being the librarian of Congress or anything else worth a second look, but along comes today. And you know what today is? What, then? Forty years that I've been here as librarian. And they're going to celebrate. The town's giving me a banquet tonight with all the trimmings. The mayor, the head of the Chamber of Commerce. I look at me, son, and stop moaning. All my life, I've been a big nobody, too. But tonight, I'm the toast of the town. I'm glad you're here. You've got to come to that banquet. <laughs> I stood in the back of the big old drafty city hall to give a listen to what went on. To watch the whole town pay on it to Ben. Arthur Henderson, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, got up and banged on the table. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here tonight to pay honor to a fine citizen. Our librarian, Ben Carter. Arthur Henderson of all people. Henderson hadn't read a book all the way through in his life. My friend, citizens of Wilmont. We're here tonight to commend and honor Ben Carter for his trustworthiness, his honesty. This guy kidding. And so I give you your friend and mine, Ben Carter. <laughs> ben, ben, as president of the Chamber of Commerce, I am proud to present you with this plaque to Ben Carter for 40 years of honesty. <laughs> Well, don't just stand there, Ben. Say something. All I can say is... Ben, don't run out like that. You want to hear a speech from you. Where are you going, Ben? Don't let him go, folks. I I guess we should have expected this. The old fellow is just... Well, just overcome by emotion. Oh, that overcome by emotion. My left elbow. What's the matter with you people? Don't you have any sense? Why don't you give him a plaque for brushing his teeth or... Or combing his hair. 
to Ben Carter in grateful appreciation for combing his hair every day. I, uh, I don't understand. No, you wouldn't. This town doesn't deserve a man like Ben Carter. Oh, wait, 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 nice of them to give it to me, wasn't it? Look at what it says. It says to Ben. I guess I was wrong this afternoon, boy. Meet another big nothing. Now, please go ahead. Mr. Carter? Oh, hello, Mr. Elwood. How's your daughter? Oh, much better, Mr. Carter. <laughs> she enjoys Little Women. I finished reading it to her this morning. <laughs> Made her cry. Oh, dear. What's wrong? Um, this book was due yesterday, the 27th. This is the 28th. I guess I will find. But that's just a penny, Mr. Elwood. Uh, here you are. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. Uh, come again. Glad your daughter's better. producer, Mr. Michael Curtis. An ancient Latin who lived way back in the year 200 AD had something to say about a storm in a saucepan, which through the years developed into the popular expression we use nowadays for any minor incident that creates a turmoil, a tempest in a teapot. In the little well-remembered library, a man with a soul has stolen a single penny. And we hardly need a barometer to know that in the little teapot town of Wilmont, a tempest is brewing. Here's Act Two of The Copper Penny. A penny. A Lincoln head. E pluribus unum, it said. One cent. United States of America, vintage 1920. Nothing fancy about it. One penny. Good for weighing yourself, or buying a stick of gum, or for keeping a book called Little Women One Day Extra. <laughs> and not much else, unless, of course, you have a barrel full of them. Wilmont's a small town, and nothing much happens there. But that afternoon, they had their first big story since the courthouse burnt down in 1902. All right, everybody, quiet down. There's no reason to get excited. What's the story, Sheriff? There's been a murder, that's all. Murder? Man, I gate's dead. I know it. All right, clear out of here, everybody. When did it happen, Sheriff? Coroner says about two hours ago. Sheriff, if I gate's been killed, I know who did it. You do? Who did it? Well, I live right next door to Tim Elwood. I don't like him. Spends all his time with his nose in the book. What about him? Well... Old man Highgate came by last night to collect the rent. I guess Elwood didn't have the money, and there was a big argument. Elwood told Highgate to shut up, that his daughter was sick. Highgate kept on screaming. Then I heard Elwood say, you get away or I'll kill you. Well, thanks a lot. I needed a piece of information like that. All right. 
right, Albert. Don't play dead. Why would I kill him? Plenty of reasons. You're broke, out of a job. I told you before, Sheriff. I wasn't near Highgate's place this morning. Then where were you between 10 and 11? How many times do I have to tell you? I was home reading to my kid. She's sick. I read her the last couple of chapters of Little Women. Great. You don't expect us to believe that, do you? Why not? Okay, so you were reading. Did you go out at all this morning? Yes, about 20 after 11, I walked over to the library and returned the book. That'll be easy enough to check on. What was the name of that book again? Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I think I'll go visit the library, Elwood. Just like you did, eh? Open up, open up, Carter. The library's closed, but I'll be happy. Why, Sheriff, first time I ever saw you around the library, I, I didn't know you were reading. I'm not. Now cut out the small talk and show me where you keep a book called uh, uh, Little Women. What do you want to see that for? Never mind, just show it to me. Where do you keep it? Right here. Under A, A, L, cut. There we are. Uh, is the only copy of this here book? Yes. All right, now, Carter, show me where you mark down when the book is returned. Well, right here. Mm -hmm. But, Sheriff, there's something I want to... Keep tell quiet, you. will you? Uh, right here, huh? Well, just what I thought. A man's lying. This book was returned on the 27th, yesterday. What kind of idiots this man take us for? Oh, Sheriff, no. That's Sheriff. all, Carter. Thanks for your trouble. If you don't mind, I'm going to take this book. we got a murderer on our hands, and we know how to tend to him. Well, Ben just stood there with the inside of his head like a merry-go-round. <laughs> I guess this was the first time Louisa May Alcott got mixed up in a murder. He looked all around him, and for one time in his life, nothing on the bookshelf seemed to be of any help. Not Emerson, not Whitman, certainly not Edna St. Vincent Millay. Ben suffered a lot, suffered in silence in the weeks that followed, not knowing what to do. Everybody in town was there in that courtroom to watch the circus. I remember seeing Ben slip in quietly, not saying a word to anybody. He'd put on his best black tie, knit muffler. I knew he felt inside him that he was on trial. He hardly seemed to be breathing there on the back bench. I tried to catch his eye, but he just stared forward. And then the judge came. The Randolph County Court is now in session. We shall continue the case of the state versus one Timothy Elwood. All right, Mr. Prosecutor. Will Timothy Elwood take the stand? Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Sit down, please. We have already heard from our former witnesses that you outwardly threatened the life of the late Jeffrey Highgate, that you owed him a considerable amount of money. Now, Mr. Elwood, we should like to establish your exact whereabouts on the morning of the murder. Where were you on the morning of March 28th of this calendar year? I was at my home. 326 North Sycamore Street here in Wilmot. I see. Now, according to the testimony of the county coroner, the murder of Mr. Highgate occurred between the hours of 10 and 11 of the morning of the 28th at the Highgate Hope, a mile and a quarter distant from yours. Exactly where were you? What were you doing at that time? My, my daughter's been ill for some time. I, I was reading her a book. A book? Would you tell us the name of this book, please? Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I see. Did you own this book personally, or had you borrowed it from the library? It was a library book. Your Honor, my daughter could tell you that I'd, I'd read her the last few chapters that morning, but she's very sick now in the county hospital. You've got to believe me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Silence, silence in the court. Silence, silence. There will be no further emotional displays, if you please. Answer the questions at hand. Continue, Mr. Prosecutor. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Elwood, you claim you finished reading that book on that morning. Yes. What did you do with the book then? About 11.15, 11.20, I, I walked over to the library and returned it. On the morning of March 28th? Yes. Your Honor, I should like to introduce into the testimony of this trial, Exhibit A, the book in question. Mr. Elwood, to your knowledge, is this the book? The book you returned on March 28th? Yes. Yes, I, I think it is. Mr. Elwood, would you open the book and read aloud from the borrowed and returned slip in the back of this volume 
the date that it was actually returned. March 27th. Your Honor, Your Honor, I have something important to say. Mr. Carter, you're out of order. Maybe, maybe I am, Henry. I mean, Your Honor, but the whole thing's out of order. Ben, if you've got some evidence to submit, do it through the proper channels. The prosecutor will call you as a witness. He can't wait for all that. Now listen to me, everybody. Tim Elwood's right. That book wasn't returned until the 28th. What but it says the 27th. I changed it. I deliberately changed it. Changed it? What for? I, I changed it. I, uh, I changed it, Your Honor, so that I could stay on the fine. <laughs> what? Just what did the fine amount to? The book was one day overdue. The fine was a penny. One penny. One penny? No. Why, Ben? I sat in the city hall and watched you being honored for 40 years of honesty. Why would anybody want to steal a penny? I... I did it. I did it because... If you don't understand why I did it, I, I, I can't explain it to you. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to return something to the citizens of this community. Something that belongs to them. And at the same time, I wish to resign as my prayer. Here you are, Your Honor. It's a penny. The end of the story? Well, Tim Elwood was released. Some tramp finally confessed to the killing. And Ben? never went near the library again. You know, some people pine away because of a gal. I guess Ben got a broken heart, too. He missed the great, wonderful, living warmth of that library. He missed helping out the twelve-and-a-half-year-olds going on thirteen. They just called me up to tell me that Ben Carter's dead. And how can I write this story? How can I put down a cold obituary about a guy like Ben Carter? It can't be said. Maybe we'll just print it this way. An editorial on the front page. When we were very young, we suddenly sailed beyond the limits of this town. The whole world suddenly belonged to us because of very... Oh, no. No good. Can't say anything fancy about Ben. Not even Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. Shakespeare didn't say anything. Michael Curtin. As always, our story was dramatized and directed by Lawrence and Lee. Our congratulations to Jack Webb, who played the reporter, and to Herb Butterfield, who was Ben. I'll return in a moment with a word about next week's favorite story.